Hi, everyone, and welcome to Book Break. I'm Claire, a librarian here at the Greece Public Library, and today I have a very special guest, one of my dearest friends, former college roommate and avid reader, Tracy. Hi, Claire. I'm so happy to be here with you. I know, and it's her birthday, so we're going to have to like... Yes, I can't think of a better person or a better way to spend my day. If we were still in college age, we'd be into total debauchery right now, but we're doing something wholesome instead. (laughs) Well, on that note, uh... (laughs) so Tracy, tell me about some of the genres you like to read, because you've been a pretty avid reader for a long time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I generally um, index to fiction, um, and I really like sort of complex fiction in terms of, like, I think about Geraldine Brooks' book, The Horse, or mm-hmm. Horse, and, you know, it takes place over multiple um, generations, multiple characters, um, all centering in on on um, Kentucky and, and uh, horse racing, and you know, it was a fairly complex book, so I love that. But there's moments, too, that I like something really light, like Emily Henry is so fun. There's oh. great witty banter all the time. Yeah, Sean um, knows I, about I steer away. <laughs> yeah, I steer away from science fiction and those types of things. Yeah. And then occasionally good non, you know, nonfiction, um, depending upon what's kind of happening out in, out in culture and society. And, yeah, like a good memoir, you know. <laughs> I always like a good memoir, I think, so... All right. So today we're just going to kind of do a roundup of some of our recent reads. And I think we're both doing all fiction. Um, I will start with my first one, which is a book by, um, we have a community read here called Rochester Reads. And we had this author at our library. Her name is Renee Denfeld. And at that time, the book was called The Enchanted. And it was about a prison in Oregon. And when I first heard about this book, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is going to be heavy. And it is heavy. But she writes so beautifully, you find yourself sucked into the story. And I want to talk a little bit about the path that Renee Denfeld had to being an author. She is a licensed death row investigator. Um, Hmm. chief investigator for public defenders in Oregon and had worked hundreds of cases, including exonerations and helping rape trafficking victims. She was a survivor of a very difficult background. She speaks regularly on social justice issues, and she's also um, a parent of children that she adopted from foster care. So in 2017, the New York Times named Renee a Hero of the Year, and she was awarded the Break the Silence Award in Washington, Mm. D.C. So all of her books kind of have these very difficult topics, um, like runaways, prison system. And um, this one, her latest novel, which just came out in March, is called Sleeping Giants. It has the most gorgeous cover, and it is about... A young boy, it opens, a young boy named Dennis is running on a remote Oregon beach and he gets swept up by a rogue wave and he's carried out to sea. A man tries unsuccessfully to save him and that's where the story begins. So we fast forward to a number of years and we meet his half-sister. Her name is Amanda. She's just recently learned of her birth mother and that she had a brother named Dennis, and she is trying to find out more about him and also herself. So Amanda is an unusual character. She thinks a little bit differently than most people. She leaves the corners on her sandwiches. She's a caretaker for the polar bear at the Portland Zoo. Um, so she goes to this seaside town, and she befriends a retired widowed police officer named Larry, and he begins to help her on this quest to find out what happened to her brother on that fateful day. Um, and one of the topics that comes back, because you're flashing back and forth in time, is you learn that Dennis was sent to Brightwood, which was a home for troubled boys there on the coast, and a new headmistress named Martha begins to treat the boys with holding therapies, which I had mm. never heard of before. And apparently mm. this is a real thing. And Yeah, I've heard of bonding therapy that you do, you hug and you hold people. Right. Yeah. This is yeah. more like 
wrapping children up in things so they like can't escape. So you can imagine mm. that Ooh. some things don't go well. Um, so this was a very difficult book to read at times, but yet it was fascinating and I pretty much like jumped through the whole thing. So mm. um, very interesting. Plus the, the coastline of Oregon, you can kind of picture it. She does that very well because she lives in mm. that state. So you get a fantastic idea of the setting of the story. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was my first one, which is kind of heavy. What do you got yeah. for us, Tracy? Yeah. Well, you know, talk about writers that are really good at something that's heavy. Um, you know, I uh, one of my recent books is uh, Small Mercies by Dennis Lehane. Um, you know, I got interested in this book after I had rewatched Mystic River, which was a movie adaptation from Dennis Lehane's uh, early books and actually put him on the map because Clint Eastwood created that movie. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, he's such a good, gritty crime writer. Um, and, you know, his, most of his books take place in Boston. So there's usually in like South Boston. So it's, it's, you know, a gritty, more impoverished area and, you know, life is hard. And so this book opens up in 1974. It's right at the height of bus or school desegregation. Um, and the story opens up um, with Mary Pat Hennessy, her daughter, who's a senior in high school. Uh, she's gone missing and she is desperate just to find out, you know, what's happened to her. And at the same time, there is a young black man whose body has been found. And, and there, these two stories are interconnected. And, you know, talk about hard writing. I think he does a fantastic job of covering the riots that were taking place. Mm -hmm. um, he does a fantastic job of writing with such compassion about, you know, uh, the people that lived in South Boston, they're impoverished. And, you know, they just have generational um, belief systems around what they can and can't do about um, their, you know, feeling, you know, you're mostly Irish, you know, feeling demoralized themselves and yet, you know, uh, mixing of races and um, various groups is just not something that they will put up with. And so there you have this real struggle going on and they're incensed by, you know, this white judge who, who you know, lives in a wealthy neighborhood is not even going to be touched by uh, this change and so he does you know this um and you also get how the mob the irish mob controls everything that's going on and they create this sense of safety net for people that are feeling very disenfranchised mm -hmm. um and they you know they come to people's rescue and aid but at the same time for everybody that's disenfranchised they're going to take advantage of them in terms of they are going to hire drug runners they're going to have more people that uh, will take their drugs. And so you see this, um, this, you know, this codependency that goes on. And he covers the riots. He covers in you know, these really harsh interactions, interpersonal interactions between the characters. But yet you're compelled. You know, I have such compassion for Mary Pat as she's looking for her daughter, as she's dealing with, you know, her son, her son had, pa had passed before the book opens up. And, you know, just how does somebody get to where they are in their lives? And, you know, she's a very coarse woman, but yet you feel compassion for her and you're, you're actually you're rooting her on. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he writes with these larger than life characters. In some ways, it's almost like a historical fiction. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he centers it at a time. You know, it's a true story about the riots that took place in Boston. He has a cameo appearance of uh, Ted Kennedy. He has a, you know, the, the head of the mob is, you know, Whitey Bulger, not by name, but by, you know, sort of right. everything he's doing. Yes. Um, so, yeah. So I would give this one a really strong, um, strong read. Um, despite sort of some of the harshness and he's, you know, Dennis Lehane can capture that gritty crime that's going on and in a way that um, that his humor balances. He's, he always has these great one liners in there as well. So it balances out, you know, the harsh realities of the of, of these characters lives with some just bust out laugh, you know commentary well didn't you grow up in massachusetts so do you did you feel any like connection on that level 
Um, not necessarily because I was out, of course, outside in the suburbs, okay. right? So we weren't impacted at all at that time. You know, I, we weren't even impacted at all. Um, and, you know, this takes place in 74. So at this point in time, we've moved to the the Washington, D.C. area. And, of course, okay. we're on the suburbs outside okay. of Washington. So we really have sidestepped all of that, um, all of the desegregation, you know, for me, at least in, you know, my um, when I was going through elementary school and, and whatnot, when desegregation was happening. Do you think this one would make yeah. a good movie, too? Because I also remember. Oh, you know what? Dennis Lehane already has the rights. Um, he's got a deal now with Apple TV. And um, and so they've already commissioned the rights or however you say that. So, yeah, yeah it would definitely be made out. As, and you can see, just like you were talking about the author writing about the Oregon coastline. I mean, you you can just be you're in the you're in this neighborhood in Boston. You're driving with Mary Pat in her car. You know, <laughs> you know you're you're creeping around the neighborhoods with her. You know, and she's Looking trying to her daughter, or the detective, yeah. this detective who comes off and comes off his duty and and his life. You you're just right side by side with all these characters, and that, you know a writer that can do so, that so well. So I'm looking forward to the adaptation. You know that will occur. Oh, gosh, I'll definitely have to put that one on my list for sure. So, all right, my second one is a debut novel, which I I love debut novels. Sometimes I feel like a person's first novel is oftentimes one of the best ones they've got in them. But this one was kind of a dystopian type thing, Mm -hmm. and it was called The Other Valley by Scott Alexander Howard. And I would say if you liked a book like Never Let Me Go or The Giver, this might be a good mm-hmm. pick for you. So the setup is we have a 16-year-old girl. Her name is Odile. And she's kind of an awkward, quiet girl. And she's bullied a little bit at school. And this young man kind of comes to her rescue with a friend of his. So it, it totally changes her life. It brings her into a new mm-hmm. friends group. She starts to feel accepted. And she definitely starts to have feelings for this young man whose name is Ed May. So one day when she's walking home from school, oh, the interesting thing about this, I forgot like the most important part, is they live in a town. And to the east of the town is the same town like 20 years later. And to the west is the same town like 20 years previous. So this is very much like a time travel thing, and it's all very highly regulated. Like they have a council that determines... Oh, that's like, like the giver, too. They have yes, the council. Right. The giver, so, yeah. And yeah. so once she starts to succeed in school, she applies and is accepted to start this training to be on the council. And when she's walking home from school one day... Like the council approves if you want to visit somebody like before or after for very specific Mm -hmm. things like grief visits where you don't um, impact the future or the past, but you're allowed to like witness. So she sees these two people and she recognizes one of them when a mask come down and she recognizes like the gate and the walk and realizes that it's Edmay's parents. Mm -hmm. So they must be doing like a grief visit and so she knows that he's going to die soon Mm, Um, that's gonna be hard for her oh definitely so the book is divided into two halves so the first half you meet Odile you you go through this relationship um, and then all of a sudden you cut to the second half and she's got a very different life I don't want to reveal what happens to her what position she has because it would be like a real spoiler. But it was very grim, kind of more than a little bit depressing. But um, <laughs> Thumbs up kind of read, huh, Claire? <laughs> I know, I know. But, but bear with me, because the ending is, is definitely worth it. It's worth the slog mm-hmm. to kind of get through, because um, she decides that a change is going to come, and she figures out a way. So Mm. overall, despite the second half dragging a little bit and being more than a little bit depressing, I I found the ending redemptive and worthwhile, Mm. and I enjoyed this book and the otherworldly kind of setting. And if if you like a good coming-of-age story, 
then, mm -hmm. you know, this one would fit the bill. And I believe this one was also already optioned for some sort of TV rights. I'm not sure which channel, but um, I could totally, as I was reading it, see that. So, mm. yeah, the other valley. Interesting. So The other valley, yeah. You know, I, I run hot and cold on these dystopic type of novels. Mm -hmm. You know, as some of them I'm reading can, are, can be so... Um, you know, it, it, it's scary in terms of our future world. And right. um, and I think of like Octavia Butler and her writing. You know, she writes some of her novels like in 1994. And they're so prescient because at that time, you know, she's almost she's writing about a futuristic life. And here we are, oh, you know, yeah. and it's, you know, it's climate change and water rights and, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a charismatic a leader. <laughs> yeah, so it's really interesting how, you know, I get scared by the what the future could be for us, and but you know, there's some telling in that of leaning in and saying, okay, what do I if this was all true? What, right. What do I need to do now? You know what I mean? And, and it can be uh, um, a cry for action or a cry to pay attention or get involved in different ways. I think you told me to read that um, Octavia Butler, like you had started yeah, that. Yeah. And I still yeah. think about that parable of the sower. It was like a, yeah. a book I probably rated maybe three stars because I didn't enjoy it. But at mm -hmm. the same time, I can't stop thinking about it. And right. it blew my mind how when she was writing back then that so many of the things she wrote about have come to pass, you know, right. or, or you can totally see as being forthcoming in the not right. so distant future. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Powerful, yeah. powerful book. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. And I think about, you know, good books and I think about, Oh, were they highly entertaining, mm -hmm. you know, or do they just keep me thinking about something, right? you know, and that it's giving me some new insights about myself or about life or whatever. And it's in that it's, it's in that un, something's unresolved, mm -hmm. you know, so you keep going back. And I think that's always a sign of a good book, yeah, you know? Yeah, definitely. So what's your next one, Trace? Yeah, so um, uh, Welcome Home Stranger by Kate Christensen. It's kind of a hero's journey, or I should say heroine's journey, you know, because it's the, the uh, lead character's Rachel. And just like Dorothy returning to Kansas, only discover there's no place like home, Rachel has that kind of experience. She has been estranged from her mother and her native state of Maine for over 10 years. She and her sister uh, Celeste were raised in a highly dysfunctional family. It was just great to read about all this dysfunction. <laughs> the mom is basically totally absent and negligent and the girls raise themselves. The mother's busy. They're chasing alcohol or men, sometimes chasing their daughter, their daughter's boyfriends. Oh, no. I mean, it's just the, it's just some of the, the, the scenes, but the story opens up and the mother has just passed and Rachel's going home to deal with not only the mother's passing and her belongings and those types of things, but she has to deal with Celeste, who is super pissed off um, about, you know, Rachel not being there during, you know, during their mother's time of getting ill and, and caring for her. Um, and um, Rachel's also, you know, she's at a stage in her life. She's in her 50s. She's divorced. She's childless. She's uh, fearful of getting her job is going to be hacked. And she's a journalist. You know, she's she's working in a dying industry and right. and she's sort of resentful or sort of jealous of her sister who's married into wealth and feels like the sister has the perfect little life. So you've got this setup of, you know, dealing with their past history, dealing with, you know, the current day, things that are happening that sort of pull on you. And she arrives in Maine to be able to deal with um you know, whatever, however they want to acknowledge the mother's life. And then she, her mother gives her the home that she um, that she owned at the time of her passing. And then all, all, all kind of crazy things happen. Celeste, his um, next door neighbor, is Rachel's long life love. And they kind of have a little dalliance. So she, you know, sort of like all these little things happen. Um, and, you know, we get to this place where, Rachel is really trying hard to make sense of this relationship that she's had with her mother. And um, 
What I find really interesting is number one with her sister, Celeste, she never apologizes for coming home. You know, she, um, uh, she just felt like she needed that distance. Uh, she didn't feel compelled to come and care for her mother. Um, and I just thought, what kind of woman, and I don't mean this in a negative way, just says, I'm not doing it. You know, that has really, it's kind of like a really good boundary in a, in a, in some, some way. And mm -hmm. how, how many of us say, feel this sense of obligation and you're hating every second of it. Right. So she has to deal with, you know, the issues with her sister, right? And their relationship is so deep for, because they were just so, such caretakers of each other when they testing, were, testing, um, one, they two, were growing three, up. This is this is the great thing about having a construction project going on at the library. <laughs> you just don't know what you're going to hear or 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 have. So well, it's real life. You know, it's just like when you're you're recording from home and you've got somebody in the background or the washing machine's going or someone decides you know the dog the, the dog decides to come in too. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it was. <laughs> and anyways so you know you're talking about a book could be a downer this is not a down you know i've just kind of described what's going on and it's not a downer you know it just feels really you know really real in terms of coming to terms with life and figuring out how to you know examine the decisions that you've made the unintended consequences mm -hmm. for you know the life that you've been dealt you know in terms of her uh rachel and celeste upbringing and um and yet she she can in the end she can and I, you know I, I don't want to give it all away but just like Dorothy she discovers that there is no place like home. Okay, that one sounds actually really good too. Now you're like adding yeah. to my list, so yeah. Well, you always add to mine, Claire, which I always love. <laughs> I always get good recies from you, <laughs> including I think the next one that you're. Um, you're going to talk about, you know, the, 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 this one and then the, the previous um, book that this author wrote. You, uh, you wrote, you yes. Know, yeah. Yeah. This yeah. One, my last one is Anita de Monte Laughs Less by Sochil Gonzalez. I think I'm pronouncing her name right. I was trying to practice before we got on. Um, this one was a Reese's Book Club pick, and this is her second novel. The first one was Olga Dies Dreaming. Is that, did you mm -hmm. read that one Yeah, too? that's the yeah. one. Right, yeah. right. That was so good. Yeah. yeah. So um, this one is about a first-generation Ivy League student who discovers the genius work of a female artist decades after her suspicious death. So mm. we're going, we're flashing back and forth between two timelines. In 1985, Anita de Monte, a rising star in the art world from Cuba, is found dead in New York City. Um, she fell off the, the roof of a building, and her tragic death is the talk of the town until it isn't. Um, by mm -hmm. 1998, Anita's name has been all but forgotten. Um, certainly by the time that our, our next protagonist, whose name is Raquel, she is a third-year art history student and preparing to write her final thesis at Brown University. So she feels out of place, very much like our, our first person did. Uh, she's surrounded by privileged students. Her, her futures are already paved out for them. She feels like an outsider. Um, mm. Students of color like her are the minority there and have the pressure to work twice as hard for the same opportunities. So Raquel becomes romantically involved with a well-connected older art student and surprisingly finds herself rising up the social ranks. So as she attempts to She's trying to almost straddle both worlds, like where she came from, her previous friends, and then this new wealthy family that she's, you know, now become involved with. Mm -hmm. um, she's researching topics for her senior's thesis, and she kind of stumbles onto Anita's story and then realizes a lot of the dynamics of that story are starting to mirror her own story. Mm -hmm. So... Um, it moves back and forth between the perspective of the two women, and it's kind of like a parallel structure. Um, 
it's it's sad how both women kind of feel they need to compromise themselves in order to make them their partners happy and and also kind of appear exotic at the same time mm -hmm. um, interesting it was very interesting so the the really interesting part is this is based the first part with the the artist that died it's based on a real person her name was right. Anna Mendieta and she was a Cuban artist who plunged from her death from the window of a 34th apartment in Greenwich Village and was married to an art star husband, uh, a minimalist sculptor named Carl Andre. So he was tried and acquitted for her murder. Um, and after a very brief lull, then his career took off again and he began to thrive. So um, they kind of portrayed the artist, his wife, as a hysterical Hispanic who sacrificed herself due to like weird beliefs. So that's all part of this. And this, um, this novel kind of gave an element of magical realism to some of that mm -hmm. with um, mm -hmm. her life in Cuba and different things she believed in. So it's a it's a very unique reimagining. I thought it was interesting, and um, her the character of Raquel in in modern day is kind of based loosely, they think, on her own background, going to Brown, being from Brooklyn, and um, oh, interesting. Yeah, so a lot of themes of culture shock and domestic abuse, and also like gaslighting. Mm -hmm that type of thing it was mm -hmm. it was it was really interesting some people really didn't like the magical realism reimagining part but i personally did because it gave like a nice element of um some revenge <laughs> let's just say <laughs> <laughs> i know you eye for an eye <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, we got to have our come on, but here, you know. So, so that was my Sounds last like one. a good one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I liked uh, I, I like this author because she does expose. Well, the first book in particular, all good dies dreaming. Um, you know, cult, uh, Hispanic culture, um, assimilation. Um, you, you know, unlikelihood of success, like how do you follow a dream, Yeah. you know, and um, particularly when other people's paths are, are paved so much easily um, or easier mm -hmm. um, and just giving, giving a sense of, of uh, life that I, I haven't walked in, you know? Right. Exactly. So what's your last one, Tracy? Yeah. So this is Day by Michael Cunningham. And when I heard this book was coming out, I was excited because I really enjoyed the hours, which he wrote, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. I forget how long ago it was. And I like the structure of that book because he takes three, um, uh, three different characters across one day. In this book, it's structured on a day, April 5th um three years apart and it just happens to be during the pandemic so it's you know before during and the year after the pandemic um and so in general i'm I kind of attracted to how does somebody evolve and change over time mm -hmm. um and you know you, you've got the element of the pandemic you know in this but in in particular how do people evolve and change over time when they're feeling stuck in life. So the book opens up with three characters. It's Isabel and Dan who are married. Um, and then Robbie, who's Isabel's brother. The three adults live together in an apartment along with Isabel and Dan's children, uh, two children. Um, and, you know, these characters are middle age ish and they're grappling with life at this stage. You know, life isn't really working out the way that they all had thought um, it would, or they're discovering that uh, relationships are much more messy or difficult than they ever even thought that they would they would be. Um, and so you get this, you know, examination of the, the interior lives of these characters, and you get that through, you know, some of the dialogue that takes place, 
through their observations that they're making um, through even and through some, you know, a fictional Instagram account that Robbie owns. <laughs> and um, and so, you know, you 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 hear some of their lament, you hear some of their wanting and longing for something different, but yet, how, how do you do that? Right. So, you know, I kind of, I kind you said that that's like, that's all of us, you know, on some level. Oh, and yeah, then you've definitely. got, you've got the twist of the pandemic, um, uh, in, in this book. Um, and you know, I, I'm still sort of grappling with it. You know, when you were talking about, you know, the book is still staying with you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this book is still staying with me. I'm still kind of sort of sorting it through because, you know, what um, Cunningham is really examining is, you know, the very our, our human wants and needs and what do we do or don't do to try to satisfy them or when they're not being satisfied. So, for example, you know, when we want a partner that's going to help us feel safe or that we're realizing that how we were attracted to a partner because they were exciting. And then all of a sudden that excitement is gone. You know, does that mean the relationship is gone? And do you try to rekindle it or what? Or, you know, sort of like, or you make a decision that, you know, deeply disappoints your parents. And so you spend, you know, the next good portion of your life um, justifying that decision only to really come to the realization that, that that actually that rationalization has been getting in my way of really pursuing what I really, really want. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I find that really interesting about how do we become in- more intentional in the, uh, you know, creating and moving towards the life that we want, even when you have stumbling blocks, things like the um, the pandemic. And they did a nice, interesting twist with the children Um, one of the characters is, she must be five and she's like a unique, like a unique girl. And, um, and how, how, you know, there's this longing for wanting to be seen and in our uniqueness, you know, and I think that how often parents or people miss or we, any one of us gets missed because people can only see what they expect out of life or expect out of you and um and yet yeah, there's so much more dimension you know we're so we have so many more facets and facets and dimensions to ourselves um so you know i don't want to go into the details and be a spoiler in terms of how the pandemic pays in but again I, kind of the writing was kind of flat this is why i'm mixed on this one it was kind of flat um but yet it has me still chewing and thinking about thinking about my own life and 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 those wants and needs and and um and you know again that the human condition so yeah. well wow well i would say that we definitely have some heavier topics today but some really good ones for people <laughs> to think about for sure um yeah and but probably... is a good writer can help us examine those things or get you know get into um you know the harsh realities of life but yet feel compelled and interested by them right you know that their writing is such that you have to jump in, you, know, you just have to jump in that sidecar and go with all these characters. Yeah, I would say that any of these would make a great book discussion, too. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. Probably a lot of them um, have yeah. something to, to talk about or discuss, besides just yeah, drink dilemmas. wine and cheese, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although there's nothing wrong with that, so. <laughs> Well, thank you so much yeah. for joining me on your birthday. And um, well, thank you, Claire. I appreciate being asked. Yeah, sharing sharing your books with us. I look forward. Hopefully, we can have you on again sometime, Trace. That would be great. I would love that. And okay. I always, like I said, I always enjoy the recommendations that I've gotten from you from books, and and it's been such a delight over the years. I think one of the reasons where my my real interest in getting back into reading, having more t- a bit more time is because you are always talking about good books and you and other friends. And so it's just being able to dive in and then talk about them is really fun. And I don't belong to a book group. So I always love having a conversation with you about the books that I've been reading and, and hearing what you're, what you've been reading. So thank you. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah, we definitely in our group of college friends have a lot of avid mm-hmm. readers that like oh, to yeah. share what we're reading. So yeah, yeah. Awesome. 
All right. Well, thank you so All right, my friend. Yes. You have a great day. I hope it's I hope the day isn't interrupted more by construction. <laughs> no. <laughs> testing, All right, testing. Take care. Take care. Thanks for All joining right, us. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Thanks for joining us on Book Break, and we will see you next time. And May, we're going to be doing a, one of our episodes will be about mysteries, and hopefully I'll be getting our director to join us. So thanks so much. Book Break is a production of the Grease Public Library, made possible through the support of the Friends of the Grease Public Library. Theme music composed and performed by Sean Greif.